26 Black History Boot Camp. If you tuned in live, that was Molly Music's A Walking Song. Uh, this is your girl, Vanessa. I'm walking in North Carolina right now, and I'm hopefully joined on the line by my girl, Morgan. Are you there, Morgan? I'm here. I'm a little bit out of breath. I don't know why, because I'm on day six of this walking. So, you know, it should be getting my lungs up. <laughs> I should be getting my lungs up, y'all. Lungs but I know are not that I... safe in no six days. <laughs> it ain't safe in no six days. You need at least 21 days to see the yeah. for your lungs to be active right now. You're right. You're right. Progress is progress. Got to play the long game, y'all. So hopefully... Something in your spirit has unloosed in these last couple of days, but it may not be that your lung capacity has expanded to where you needed to be yet. But it's a journey, and we are on this journey together. And we are doing this 21-day walking meditation with women who are calling in and allies and folks who are calling in from all over the world, and they walk with us live um, at noon Eastern time. How are you feeling, Morgan? feel good. It's hot. These mosquitoes is out, boy. <laughs> was, did, you, did, you skeeter? Skeeter. did you say mosquitoes? Did you say mosquitoes? I'm from Mississippi, so I'm trying to act like you ain't from New Orleans. You from Seattle by way of New Orleans, by way of Africa. I'm saying, you know what the mosquito is. It ain't even New they Orleans, it's Shreveport. Oh. It's Shreveport, oh. you know, it's country oh. out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I'm outside, it's humid, it rained last night, it was so beautiful. I just took a long walk on the beach yesterday. And I put I put some um, footage up on my Instagram. It was my I lips and I was ashy. <laughs> but I was just like, I feel good about my life, and I feel good about who I am. I feel good about aging. I feel good about my beauty. It doesn't matter. I don't. I I do care, but I don't. I'm like finding alignment in my life in a way that like is undisturbed. It's undisturbed, and I just feel so grateful for that. And I just I don't know. I just. I'm looking into the good of everybody around me. I'm just trying so hard. Like, I'm just trying. But yesterday was hard. So I had to go out to that beach. I was out there walking. Yeah. I feel good. I feel good now. How are you feeling? I feel um, good, too. I'm a little tired, but only because it's not like a bad tire. But you know how you receive so much in sometimes. And you have to, like, process it all out. The last couple of days have just gym jam packed for me with this like relationship and conversation and work and all sorts of stuff. And I feel like I'm just holding a lot of space inside. And so I'm going to uh, get back home to Washington, D.C. today. And um, I'm driving back with my best friend's 15 year old daughter. We got a whole playlist. <laughs> We're about to bump. And her name is Joy. We grew up together in Seattle. Um, and I was stunned when she asked me to drive her daughter back because I was like, you don't trust me with your daughter. But no, it's just like, <laughs> but I was um, just happy that um, we were able to connect. So I'm looking forward to getting back home. And then I'm looking forward to tomorrow's conversation with you and um, just finishing up this week strong in boot camp. Boot camp has been exactly what I thought it was going to be for me, Morgan. It's been such a time to like ground down it's been so reassuring to get to talk to you every day you're such like my you hold so much spiritual space for me and I just really 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 appreciate you if I don't say it enough I apologize but I just love you and I appreciate you and it just feels like such a privilege to get on these conversations with you each day and to be able to walk it's very sweet that yeah. is very sweet. I appreciate you too, V. I didn't know Joy had a daughter. <laughs> like, yeah. How well do I even know you and your best friend? I, 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 know. I, know. I know. I know. Oh my God. Speaking of um kids, I went down to Caden's graduation. Um, shout out to you, Anna, my friend, for a long time ago. Yeah. We were teachers together. He was so big. It's like they be like babies in the fifth grade, and then they just be in eighth grade, just grown up. Just, they just be men. Yeah. But you know, it's scary because they look like them, but they're still kind of babies. You know, you look in their face. That's and exactly like, oh, right. A baby. So we just have to That's rally right. around these. Uh, shout out to all the graduates around the world. I know. I've been Ooh, seeing a ton so of them. Proud. I know. It's such he's a big so deal. And it's such a, I remember that time in my life so clearly. It was just like, I felt like, every single thing was possible for me and yet it felt like I was stepping out in like 
this big faithful way that I didn't know what was going to happen. And it just, I it was such an exciting time. So I feel so now excited. At my eighth grade graduation, I wore um, a crop top shoulder pad jacket with um because you always been t morgan dixon who's about to get to be the president yeah so you had i was going to be the president and i had on these little crop uh, pants these little things and it was really a choice that's what i'm saying i was making choices about my life and i was like this feels like progress that's why i like you because we would have been friends because i had a herringbone pencil skirt black and white in eighth grade and you couldn't tell me that my lawyer Yes, and Morgan and I didn't know each other in eighth grade, but God was setting it up, y'all, that we were going to know each other because really we were the same people. <laughs> no, we were boardroom sexy. That's what I <laughs> Yeah, no, that's good. But yeah, no, 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 I've been feeling good too. I've been feeling good too. I know we have a beautiful program today, so I just want to, um, yeah. I really want to listen, Vanessa, and learn from you on, on I know you have some, some good things planned, but I will say last night I was texting you um well, it, it just occurred to me one of the things that um alice coltrane's family said to me that she used to say um was to mind your words and i was just thinking i bet i could say 20 percent less in my life even 50 percent less in my life and really think about the words that i'm saying and stop trying to solve everything with words but to really think about my intentions and my belief and my faith and let that speak and let that illuminate me. And so I was just like, maybe that's for somebody out there who's trying to solve some problems with your words. Maybe take some silence and take some break today um, from trying to explain or defend yourself. And Alice Coltrane's family told me, and it was just something I thought of um, to share with you all too. I shared it with Vanessa last night. She also said, mind your words, mind your thoughts. And she said that 4 a.m. is the universal meditation hour. Um, it has been throughout time, and she was like, she just always, um, it uses those early morning hours as sacred tradition for silence, for prayer, for meditation, for peace, for long and meandering walks, um, and so I just encourage you, maybe it's not 4 a.m. because sleep is also really important to your health, but first thing in the morning, make sure it's sacred for you. And make sure you figure out some kind of pathway where you can have some quiet time by yourself. Um, so I just wanted to share those two things that I had remembered last night. And I texted them to Vanessa, but I forgot that I hadn't told y'all. Morgan, God is working so much through these conversations that it's bigger you all than we can even understand. And Morgan and I don't rehearse and we don't even tell each other like how we're going to lead the conversation when we trade off each day. But today's entire conversation, and the principle is be still. And today's entire entire conversation is about our words. And it's about do we need to use them? And when do we use them? And how do we connect with the stillness inside? And I'm going to tell you this, Morgan. I knew I wanted to do the principle of stillness and how do we be still because the people who I know and respect who are really well and healed have some real muscle around it. And when I started to do the research for this episode to say, like, who do I think throughout history has mastered this for us as Black people so that we could talk about them, I discovered the story of a man named John, Dr. John Francis. And we rarely do people who are alive because it's Black history boot camp, not Black living boot camp. But we have in the past when we've had some real spiritual warriors, I'm thinking of Diamond Reynolds, Philando Castile's uh, girlfriend, Bree Newsome, Corey Bush, when the, there have been some stories that we are just right, like right now, these people are walking amongst us and they have something they have to, that we need to learn from. And when I read Dr. John Francis's story, I was like, we have to learn from this beautiful beautiful black man in his 70s who has lived such a spectacular life and I wanted to tell his story and I want to introduce his story to everyone and I'm just going to introduce it in a couple of minutes because we did reach out to Dr. John Francis and he's going to join us on this call and Morgan I yeah it's like you didn't know when you said that this is it's working and he did how could he have known we were going to do alice coltrane and then alice coltrane's family was going to listen and then they were going to tell morgan you got to mind your words and then morgan's like i I can use 40 percent more less words or 60 percent less words and we're going to talk about a man who remained silent for 17 years 
17 years this man remained silent. 17 years. And so I want to give some backstory on him so that we can bring him in because that I don't understand. That I can't even begin to fathom or comprehend. Like it, it was so hard for me. I listened to several interviews, but I was just trying to navigate and understand how do you, and he didn't, Ooh, let me, let me get into it, Morgan. Let me get into it. Let me get into it. So let me start at the beginning. Um, thank you, God. Uh, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in my sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Um, Cause he's on this line and I want to do his story justice. His name is Dr. John Francis Morgan, and he was born in Philly. So Philly stand up. This is one of your native sons. He is the home, uh, the son of West Indian immigrants and a genius um, Black man who early in his 20s migrated to the West Coast and was living in the Bay Area in a tiny little sleepy town, if you guys know of Point Reyes, when in early 1970, 1971 to be exact, he witnessed, Morgan, a major um, incident that happened under the Golden Gate Bridge. And the major incident that he witnessed was two oil tankers who were owned by Standard Oil Company that collided and they dumped right there into the bay more than 840,000 gallons of oil. It was a major environmental crisis and this young black man watched it happen. And he was so convicted by this oil spill in the bay that he was like, I had to stop using motorized transportation because I have to start walking. He was like, I had a role to play in our consumption of oil. And he was immediately convicted to stop using motorized transportation and to start walking. And then he said, I just thought when I start walking, everybody else would get the picture and start walking too, because it seems obvious to me what we need to do. But instead, Morgan, what he encountered, which is what many of us will encounter when we try to do God's work, when we try to do good work, or when we try to push liberation is everywhere he went, he said people were arguing back with him. Why are you walking? Why are you trying to make us look bad? What you think you're going to do by doing that? How's that really going to help anything? And he said he found himself over and over again in arguments and conversations with people. and then. One day, Morgan, on his birthday the next year, after having not used uh, motorized transportation for over a year and having had so many arguments and conversation, he decided to stop speaking as a gift to his community and to not argue for just one day. And he said, for just one day, I decided I'm going to listen to my community and what they had to say. And do you know what happened at the end of that one day, Morgan? He said, I learned so much that I was like, I got to be quiet one more day because I'm learning so much. And then he was quiet one more I day. I need to be quiet for the whole day, five days. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, I am fatigued at talking, so yes, go ahead. That's yeah. amazing. And, and he talks about how his muscle around listening was so atrophied that he had noticed that he never really was a listener. He was just waiting to talk. And so he was like, in fact, in his mind, he was already rushing ahead to make his arguments and get his position right and that he was missing half of what anybody had to say. So as the days went on, just one day to another day to another day, he started extending it because he was learning so much. He continued not speaking. And at this point, he wasn't using motor tra motorized transportation for over 17 years. But the genius of those 17 years is what he did while he was silent. So he didn't just become silent, Morgan. First of all, he got three degrees during this time. And I'm talking about, he was in Washington state and was like, I wanna enroll in Southern Oregon University. So he walked. He walked from Washington state to Oregon state, y'all. He enrolled himself in Southern Oregon University and he got his degree. He then decided, Morgan, I want to study at an advanced degree at the University of Montana. Y'all, I'm not making this up. He got his stuff and walked. He left Oregon. He walked to Montana. He enrolled in the University of Montana and matriculated and got his degree at the University of Montana. He got a PhD there in environmental studies. 
he's really a pioneer of black environmentalism, Morgan. And he did all of this while not talking, completing all of his degrees. He started teaching y'all and he didn't talk in any of his classes as a professor. And he said something, he was like, and then I learned so much while teaching without talking that I realized that if you're a teacher who's not learning, you're not really teaching. And I was like, if you're a teacher who's not learning, you're not really teaching. And so this man over these years was building up this muscle of what is Girl Trek sacred practice, walking. He'd walk from Washington to Oregon, from Oregon to Montana. He wasn't using motorized transportation. He had this deep, deep vow of silence that he was using to um, basically take a stand around his convictions and in, in what he believed in. And then after he started, Morgan, walking across the United States. And Dr. John Francis walked across the United States and it took him more than seven years. He walked all the way to Washington, DC. And in 1990 on Earth Day with his black mama in the crowd saying, hallelujah, my son is about to talk. He finally spoke his first words. And from that moment on, he said he realized he had an even much bigger calling and responsibility to use the knowledge that he had acquired to really change something. And so he started working for, um, he started writing uh, policy, oil policies. I'm saying it wrong, but how you write oil policies. He started writing oil policies, I think, for the EPA, but he can correct us if I'm wrong. And then he, who is, who is from the Caribbean, he decided he was going to sail to the Caribbean. He walked all of the Caribbean islands. He walked to Venezuela and he was walking in South America, Morgan, where he realized that he had to make a change. And he talks powerfully about how the fact I translated it as we can be dogmatic in our beliefs, right? He had built this entire platform of not speaking and not using motorized transportation, but he said he arrived at a point where he thought that wasn't going to serve him in the next phase of the work he had to do. But he had to let go of this whole thing that he had built. Like I told everybody I ain't using motorized transportation, but how am I going to get to the places I need to go to to do the work I'm going to need to do? I told everybody I was going to stop speaking. And he said he walked his way away from those belief systems. And he walked his way to new belief systems because those new belief systems were going to serve him better. And he became what he is today, which is a true public servant. He became a public servant and an environmentalist. He, was named, he received the U.S. Department of Transportation's Public Service Commendation for what the work that he had done. He worked for the United Nations Environmental Program as a goodwill ambassador for the world's grassroots communities. He um, wrote a children's book that we're going to, that he's getting ready to release, and I'm sure he can tell us more about that. He, National Geographic, uh, released a documentary on his work. He did a beautiful TED Talk. I think he did his the same year that Al Gore did at TED, and we linked to his TED Talk in the email. And since then, he, people call him the Earth Walker. This Black man from Philly who went to San Francisco, witnessed this oil tanker crash, and then spent his life in service in this beautiful way. And so I want to stop there because that's, it's just so touching to me to imagine. That was such a beautiful introduction. <laughs> and I was and I was getting anxiety. I was like, well the the, the doctor is here. Like I, I realized he likes to listen. No, he likes to listen. So I was just like, work it, pull back. He likes to listen. You need to learn to listen. It was a, it was your most beautiful introduction ever. It was so great. Oh thank you. Yeah, I just wanted people to understand um, the opportunity we have to speak to him live. And I have a few questions and hopefully Morgan, you'll engage. I will, we can have some questions for him, but we let's bring him off mute right now and just say, hello, Dr. John Francis. One, are you there? Please hello, say hello to the Girl Trek community. And two, did we get anything wrong? And did I get anything wrong in the introduction? Dr. John Francis, are you there? Star six. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? We sure That's can. Time. Oh, good. <laughs> That's like I've been <laughs> silent for all this time. <laughs> and I've been trying to trying to get to talk to you. Hi. It was poetic, oh. sir. It was poetic. Hi, how are you? 
I'm good. Hi, my name's I'm Morgan. good. My name is Morgan. That's Vanessa, my best friend, Vanessa, and my name is Morgan. We're so pl- we're so pleased. Hey, to hi, Morgan. Today. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, how are you? Okay, who's driving? Is it Vanessa or Morgan? So both of us are out walking because we really, this is a walking podcast, and we Hot invite dog. women and people to actually walk with us while they learn these stories and history. So I'm currently walking right now in North Carolina, and Morgan is out walking um, in South Carolina. And literally, there's hundreds of women live who uh, who are walking with us from every part of the globe right this very second, and thousands more who will download the recording starting tonight so that they can walk, take a walk at their own time and listen. This is wonderful. I am so happy to hear that. And I would be absolutely thrilled to walk with you right this moment. However, I'm living in, uh, let's see, Cape May, New Jersey. And it is hailing right now. (laughs) (laughs) It just just started raining and hailing. And so I, I decided I better not do that. Well, we thank we God totally for the rain understand. because there's so much. Yeah, there, I said I thank God for the rain. There's so much smog ha- happening there from the wildfires that I can imagine. That right, right. Raining. Yeah. But thank you yeah, so you much that- for the work that you do and the walk that you walk and the talk that you talk. <laughs> Do you know Cape May um, is one of the places where Harriet Tubman lived for a while? Did you know that, Doctor? Absolutely. And, you know, um, we have the Harriet Tubman Museum, I think, which opened up last year, uh, or maybe it was two years ago. It um, feels like it was just yesterday. But it's a, a wonderful tribute to to, um, to Harriet. And I remember that I have to remind myself that I um, wrote a book, actually, uh, that I put Harriet Tubman, well, she had to be in the book, because it was about kindness. It was a book about kindness and how Harriet, as a, you know, her kindness, kindness comes in, in many different ways and packages and colors and sizes and genders and everything. And Harriet was just so brave and so kind that she would walk to freedom and go back and get some more people and walk some more to freedom, you know? And so she had to have some, some kind of kindness in her. Oh, yeah, indeed. (laughs) She's she's been such a uh, matriarch for us. She's been such a matriarch for us, not only because she, walks but like what you're saying she also she walked herself to freedom but then she came back to get other people right right takes great courage yeah i think it was dr angela who said you can't practice any of the other virtues unless you have courage and i think kindness is one of those you have to have courage in order to be kind and so she went back and got other people so i just remembered when you said you were in cape may that she was there too um, Vanessa is leading the conversation. I know she has some good questions for you. I have a few too, Vanessa, but I will defer to you. And then just um, when it's time for me to ask questions, I will um, chime in and ask them of mine. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Um, I told someone that uh, about your story yesterday, a, a table full of women, and they were like mouths were, their jaws are dropped. And then one of the women said, wait, he didn't sing in the shower though, or talk to himself at home? She was like, he didn't even hear the own sound of his voice for 17 years. So I want to actually start there. Like, were you totally silent for 17 years? And did you not talk to your own self at home or like sing your favorite songs? Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I can. Thank you for that question. And um, that's a good one because uh, I, I figured I knew what I was going to say, right? So I, I didn't have to say it. <laughs> but um, I was totally silent for, I think it was about seven years, where I wouldn't make a sound, not, not a sound. And when someone would tell me a joke and I thought it was funny, I would, I would open my mouth and nod my head and slap my leg. And my friends thought that was just the weirdest thing that I wouldn't laugh. 
<laughs> they said, John, it's it's just so weird, you know, that you, I mean, you don't talk, and, but you won't laugh. And it, it happened, I think, in 19, um, gosh, 1979, that I was taking a music course and the, the professor, when I was at the University of of uh, Southern, Southern Oregon University, and and that I walked up there from California, uh, and I, I I remember him asking me. He said, "Well, John, you have to uh, sing the scales, you know, do re mi." And I said, I, I just kind of shook my head. He said, "Well, can you whistle? You you can whistle, right?" <laughs> I went, I went. <laughs> <laughs> you can't whistle. He says. He says, "How about humming? That's not talking." <laughs> so I would. Mm-hmm. He says, "That's it. That's it." And so I ended up humming, boy. And that was once I started humming. That was something. I mean, <laughs> my friends said, "Oh, God, thank God, <laughs> at least something." So I did hum. Yes. Uh-huh. Can you explain what your conviction was around the silence? Like, what was it that gave you that level of practice and discipline? Well, um, you know, I I think these kind of things kind of happen. I, when I grew up, I, I grew up Baptist. My my family was Baptist. And then um, we they wanted to send me to the Catholic school, and you had to convert to Catholicism. Well, you know, I I went over to the Catholic school and I started learning about uh, the the priests and the monks. I said, monks? That what these monks? They would go off and they wouldn't speak. I said, that's you know, they they had these cool robes on, you know, and I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to be a monk. And uh, they sang songs and things like that, you know, and prayed. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. So I told my parents and I told the priest there at the at the school I went to. And he said, well, let's go up to a monastery. And took me to a monastery. And he said, see, there, there they are working out in the field. And uh, actually, they don't talk, John. Well, I thought it was a vow of silence. Actually, it's a code of silence, and and they can speak, but not often. <laughs> and I thought at that time, oh no, 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 no! I don't think really I could do something like that. And so I decided not to become a monk. Ten years later, there I am walking around in California, <laughs> not riding in cars and not speaking. Come on. <laughs> So God really, God really does have a strange way and, uh, and he's got a, you know, and she's got a, a, a really good sense of humor too, I think. That is so hilarious. <laughs> is it is so hilarious. hilarious. <laughs> but it is yeah. hilarious. And I still think people are listening and going, okay, he had a predisposition then to spirituality that attracted him and it's the idea of these monks and so you at least had an idea of the possibility and yet was it your political belief that drove that drove you to the silence and kept you silent or was it the personal experience and transformation like what was it though that every day made it something that was possible and achievable for you well, I think that the the first thing was that I had never experienced this before, and it was so amazing to me that you know I had shut up. <laughs> I thought that was kind of like a miracle in itself, and that during this time that I had shut up, I started learning. I started learning from all the people who were around me that oh my gosh, I hadn't really been listening. You know, as you said, I'd just been waiting to to be able to say something, you know, not really caring about what they said. And if they said something, I already, you know, knew in my mind I could listen to just a little bit 
a few words and tell if it's something that I believed or I didn't believe. I didn't really have to listen to the rest of what they were saying, which was, you know, the big mistake, because when you do that, you end the communication by not listening. That's the other part of communication is listening. And so I would already be in my mind thinking about what I was going to say. And, and I might even answer in something that wasn't even relevant to what was being said. Um, and I realized that by that first day of not speaking, um, that, gee, maybe I should do this another day <laughs> because I'm learning so much. And, and it went from one day to the next day. And until finally it was a week had gone by and I hadn't spoken in a week. And it's, that was such an impetus of not having spoken in a week. I said, well, I'm going to do this for another week. And then eventually I got to the place where I, you know, people were very concerned because first I had started walking and now I had stopped talking and there was a little community. So everybody knew that what was going on. Um, I decided that I was asking the question too, when are I was going to, when, when are you going to start speaking? And so was everybody else. John, when are you going to start speaking? This is crazy. And I decided I was not going to speak for a year. And then on my birthday, I would ask myself again, if, it's if this is still appropriate and if I was still learning and should I start speaking and it lasted, you know, 17 years. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Whoa. We've been talking so much Vanessa about, um, not only Alice Coltrane and like tapas and like, uh, ahimsa and do no harm and all these different spiritual practices and principles and fasting but this idea of fasting of your words and, and withdrawing of your words is just feels so foreign to me as someone who speaks for a living but yet it feels so relaxing like it's just like my god if I wasn't just <laughs> waiting to make my point or waiting to defend myself or waiting to defend black women or black people and I was able to really listen and bring in like this kind of compassion, like what magic could happen in that circumstance. And so I'm just so grateful for that lesson. I was feeling like that yesterday. You may have heard I was at the beach yesterday. I was just feeling so overwhelmed with the, with the possibility of liberation and the possibility of, you know, saving our community, saving our world, saving our planet and the role that I, I must take in it. And I feel very convicted to take in it, but that feels overwhelming and part of like the message that I heard when I was out on that beach is just, you have to understand the force of faith. And you have to understand that it's not you, that you can't concretize into self, into one voice, but that you have to like, um, you have to relax into the possibilities that all people have answers. And so this could not have come at a better time. So I just wanted to chime in and say, thank you for that. <laughs> I had never even considered like, um, a fast of words for that long in 17 years feels so, oh my God, epic. It feels so epic. It's so beautiful. Thank you. I have, I have a question for you. It, do you. Can you talk specifically about the walking itself? We've talked about the silent part, but also just you walked across America, you walked to all of these different states. Is there something specific from the walking that you gathered, relied on, experienced that you think was a great lesson or teacher for you? Wow, that's an, also another, you know, good question. And I'm not sure that some, anyone has asked me that in the sense that um, that walking was, a, you know, was my vehicle. And so was uh, the not speaking. I think Thomas Merton, who was one of the, one of the uh, um, Baptist monks here in, in the United States. He uh, was a jazz musician who went into the monastery and his abbot said, you know, you have so much that you have to uh, teach us. You should write. 
and he became not just a, a monk that would go off and live in, in silence and reflection, but one who wrote books on contemplation and uh, his life and uh, the spiritual life. And one of the things he wrote was about pilgrimage, which we're all on. You know, we're all on that pilgrimage. And he said, you know, there's a physical pilgrimage that um, we go through this landscape. And then there's another pilgrimage, the second pilgrimage is an an inner journey, that inner pilgrimage. And he said, one can relate to the other and uh, you can have one or the other. But he said, it's really best to have both. And I think the walking, the walking was... um, reflective for me uh, of the silence because the inner landscape was very much um, part of the outer landscape. And the people that I met were very important um, to all of that. I mean, to be able to listen to everyone, uh, no matter who they were and uh, where they were, uh, that they were on the journey, they were on the road with me, um, no matter what color they were or what political persuasion they were. People were, which I discovered, very kind to me. And I would not have made that journey. I would not have gone to the other side uh, of this country from the West Coast to the East Coast with a with a smile still on my face and and joy in my heart if people weren't kind. And so I'm always grateful for the kindness that um, everyone showed me. Mm. I love that. It's, we have every story tell, almost on the news tells us otherwise, right? It tells us that we are um, savages, essentially, in the way that we treat human human beings and humankind and we see so many of those stories but I think that women who especially in girl trip are walking also do experience that when they're out on their walks like another level of humanity and another level of engaging in it with their neighbor um, and I think we're able to experience happiness that way um, and kindness that way so yeah I love I'd this. like to add Dr. Francis that I guess it was maybe five or six years ago Um, our national team walked on the Underground Railroad and we walked 100 miles in five days um, with our staff. And actually most of it was in silence, right, Vanessa? Because it's hard to walk Mm -hmm. a marathon every day. (laughs) And it was, it felt like a spiritual pilgrimage. And there was, and we talked about this on one of our TED Talks, Vanessa and I, that on one particular walk, there was a man, and we were walking through places that politically um, are very different, um, than most people on this phone, I would, I would argue. And, um, but I don't know about, uh, that's a whole nother story. Cause I think people are much more alike than we are. Super. <laughs> but there was a man who um, we had had some experiences with people with pickup trucks, like revving by us. Um, Cause we had been on the news and everything and, you know, Confederate flags and all these sorts of things. And, you know, we got to a place where there was a man on the side of the road who had a, um, you know, like a flannel shirt on and a pickup truck. And our team was like, oh, we now fall in front of a banana in a tailpipe. So <laughs> like, we're just walking by like, nope, 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 nope. Um, and they walked by uh, this man. And then I got there and I don't know why, but I just said hello to him. And he was nervous. It was like in the middle of a nor'easter, kind of like what you're experiencing now up in Cape May. And it was just rainy and miserable. And he just kind of came over and he said, are you the ladies walking on the Underground Railroad? And we, I said, yes, sir. And he goes, I heard you on Christian radio and I wanted to bring you supplies. And he brought us Kleenex <laughs> and water and granola. And I just was so moved. I was so moved by my early fear and the fear of my comrades and sisters. And then I was just so moved by his kindness. And I was so moved by um, the fact that anybody looking at us would have guessed that we were separate. But in that moment, we were united with this gentleman. Um, And that felt good. So I can attest to and raise a hand of testimony to exactly what you're saying. That's a beautiful story. That's a beautiful story, and that is that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you experienced that, and uh, when I taught, I did 
teach in uh, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison after I had gotten my degree and gone off and started speaking again. I came back and I taught a, a class uh, called Planet Walking, which I've been known as the the Planet Walker, and it's the name of the the nonprofit uh, organization that. Um, I and a group of friends founded when I started walking across the country. And uh, we went out as a, a class and we would, I'm uh, walking back across the United States. So sometimes in uh, from Indiana into Ohio and to, uh, uh, and we're going into Ohio and to Illinois, we were going to Indiana and to Illinois. And uh, as we were getting across the the midwest uh people would come with uh you know water and food and <laughs> places for us to stay and my students said you know when you told us that you walked across the country when we read your book that you walked across and people were so kind we we just couldn't believe that but but that's how people are we're experiencing it ourselves, and and I think that in that journey, I'm not going to say that, you know, it's always that way, but I think more times than not, it is. People are kind and kind to each other, and I just hope that that catches on, and <laughs> we can practice being kind to one another um, more than we here we are, you know, and I think that if we are kind to each other, a lot of things are going to uh, resolve themselves. And when I got to the East Coast of the United States, I think the thing that really impressed me after studying environment all the way up to a PhD level was that um, it had changed for me. It had changed from being just about you know, loss of species and habitat and pollution. Those were truly part of our, the issues, the things that we needed to, to address. But because people were the environment, because we're part of the environment, how we treated one another was really our first opportunity to treat the environment in a sustainable way or even understand what we mean by sustainability. So environment for me became about all of those things we traditionally think of, but also about human rights and gender equality and economic equity and, and all the ways we relate to each other. Because as we relate to each other, if we oppress one another, if we exploit each other, that's going to manifest in the physical environment around us. And so uh, kindness, you know, we have to be kind to each other. We have to care for each other and we have to love each other. And that's going to manifest in the physical environment around us. Uh, that's the calculus that I discovered on my walk across America. Sir, I have to tell you that um, it has already manifested that the walk that you began um, so many years ago, for so many years, has manifested in the movement that you are supporting and contributing to now. We have over a million Black women who walk together who talk together and who solve problems together. And one of our core values is kindness. And we call it, we say we practice an ethos of radical welcome, where all are welcome. And that this is a movement to help black women live our healthiest, most fulfilled lives so that we can increase life expectancy of black women by 10 years and 10 years, but that anybody who is in that mission can walk with us. And that feels radical almost by itself. <laughs> it feels radical almost by itself, yeah. whether you are allies, whether you are men, you can walk with us and walk by our sides. And so I have to tell you that what you said that you hoped would manifest is already beginning to manifest um, right this moment as you talk to um, what will be thousands of women who will listen to this on their walk. So I'm grateful for you. And then I had a question that had a lot to do with what you just said. 
Um, and it, it felt just ironic because I'm walking on a farm and Vanessa's walking on a farm now, both black owned farms. I was literally picking blackberries and eating them while I was talking, while I was listening to you <laughs> and um, under these Spanish oaks and it's just gorgeous. And I remember uh, to have a relationship with the National Outdoor Leadership School and I was on the board and I spoke to their faculty one time up in Lander, Wyoming. And I and started laughing it was a mostly a white a white crew with like all these puffy coats on they started laughing because they didn't have an expansive definition of environment the way that you do and the way I would argue that we do and I, and still I understood their disbelief and laughter because when I go to things like the climate march or when we have footage at you know at things you know and we have seats at the table for you know diversity in the outdoors and environmental participation of the black community in natural environment issues and conservation and I wonder why you think that is Yeah, that's a that's a, a really good question, and um, I think because and it, it, and it's not I mean it's not an easy answer, but I think because we don't know, and <laughs> we have you know um, especially here in America and and you know and I say America I mean the United States where we have been. Um, looking at you know slavery and what slavery has done to the people here i mean all of us i mean slaveholders and people who have been slaves and to the country um we really have to come to grips with that i think and and understand that well if we are treating people <laughs> <laughs> the way we're treating them, does that just, or can we just do that? Can can we treat ourselves that way and without having any repercussions? And I don't think so. I think that and capitalism, you know, run rampant is uh, something that we're looking at the, we're looking at the effects so much, like we're looking at the pollution, we're looking at the the climate change, we're looking at the trees come down. We're not looking at the rest of the environment that we are. I don't think we we say we were the environment, but we have to really understand that and what that means. And, and if we do understand it, then we, you know, we have to live the way that we believe that we understand that. Whoa. And I think that's a difficult we are situation. The environment. Yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> There's, uh, that alone could pivot everything. I think particularly because our, be our belief as an African people understood the kind of interconnectedness between the natural environment and ourselves that we never ourselves as separate. And if we're sick, and if the planet's sick, we're sick, we're sick, the planet's sick, that almost the natural environment movement feels um, incomplete if it doesn't bring in social justice issues or off the mark on some way. That is just, a, I, I, I need to think about that for a couple more days. That is fascinating to me to think about it in that term. <laughs> well, that, that's yeah. really but interesting. I mean, Sure. You know, after it's, that's the thing was that after those 17 years of silence and walking across the country and learning, I mean, going to school and getting a PhD and, and, you know, I remember getting my PhD before I, I actually got it. My major professor said, John, I've been waiting for you. And you're going to need this PhD, he says, because the people who are going to, your message isn't going to change when you get it. He says, but people are going to want you to have a PhD. If you don't have it, they're not going to listen to you. The people that need yeah. to hear this. <laughs> I couldn't believe him. I said, oh, no, come on, John, that's not that. And, he, and sure enough, uh, I, think, I think he was speaking a lot of truth there. 
But I, I want to say one other thing. I, when I walked across the United States, I sailed to the Caribbean once, and then I got to South America and I walked the length of South America. And my dream was to get to Africa and then walk the entire length of Africa. And last year was my first time in Africa. I got to, to Tanzania and... Um, and then just in February, I started my walk from Cape Town north through South Africa on my way to Khartoum and Cairo. Whoa. So I did the first okay, that, hundred miles. That's not walking in America. Listen, oh, no. that's not walking in America. There's actually lions on the continent, sir. <laughs> There's actually lions. Oh my God. That's so amazing to me. I'm so proud and so excited for you to complete that walk. And if there's any way yeah. we can we can ever amplify the work that you're doing, please let us know. We would I mean all I know I can speak for sure that our members are interested in cheering you on and supporting you and spreading the word. So please keep us in the loop as you continue your walk across the continent. Whoa. That's a big oh, deal. Oh great. <laughs> Dr. Francis, uh, I know you have you to go all soon. with me. <laughs> <laughs> to have you all with you you, with me walking is is the greatest gift. Yeah, that's the greatest are. gift. Thank we you are. so much. Yeah, we were walking with you before we even started this organization. Somehow, it kind of feels like, um, you know, time is such a weird concept, but it, it feels like you walked before us and. <laughs> And as we walk, um, you know, into the future together, it's um, and kind of uniting these forces of, of your work and our work. It's so exciting to think about how we can play a role in, in your initial, I think your initial kind of goal, which is to protect this planet, you know, the oil spill. And um, just recently, um, I had the opportunity to talk to, do you know Wangari Matai? Have you ever heard of Wangari Matai? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So her daughter was in uh, at a conference with us um, and she was given an award um, actually at the TED conference. She was given an award and I had an opportunity to sit with her. And for those on the phone who don't know um, Wangari Matai, she um, led something called the Green Belt Movement, where she taught everyday women like us how to plant trees, how to harvest trees, how to make industry around Uh, around and with the natural movement, they planted 50 million trees and brought Kenya back from the brink of environmental devastation. And so she is a hero. Right. She's the first African woman to win a Peace Prize. And her daughter is continuing that work. Well, I sat with her daughter and I said, listen here. And she said, what you doing, Morgan? I said, I need your help connecting this powerful movement of Girl Trek, which is now the largest in America for, for the health of Black women, with the work that you're doing on the continent with millions of Black women. And she just looked at me and she said, let's do it. And so there are 700 million Black women on the planet. And if we can all walk, talk, and solve problems together, I believe we will turn this planet right side up. I do. So we are just beginning, yes. and I'm grateful for the walk you started so many years ago. Oh boy, you know, and 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 Matai, she's part of that book of kindness. <laughs> she's there too for oh, the, wow. you know, in Kenya, you know, starting to plant all those trees, and she became a professor, you know, like in, um, and her, uh, they were like, you know, she became a, not just a professor, she she became Doctor Matai, so. Um, and people were like, how, yeah. well, you how tell could us she do that? that book, you know, sir? but she, yeah. say, will you tell us the name she, of she that book? Name. And Sorry, also, I know you have a children's book as well. And, and we just want to give you an opportunity to share about both. Oh, yeah. The children's book where uh, Mateo Matai is in is, in, is called Human Kindness, True Stories of Compassion and generosity that change the world. And that. it's published by What on Earth Books. 
<laughs> Which is great. <laughs> on Earth books. Two great titles. Yeah. Both great. It's great. Yeah. And is that the same book that Harriet Tubman is, is mentioned in as well? The Human that, Kindness? That book? is. Yes. Oh, we have we it's have to get that for book. our daughters. <laughs> yes. Well, we have many, many, many daughters in this movement and sons. So let's get this for our children um, and support, 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 support. Is it on Amazon? Can we get it on Amazon? Or yes, it is. I mean, you can get it anywhere. Awesome. That is awesome. This has been such an awesome conversation, Vanessa. Yeah, Dr. Francis, we really have loved talking to you, and um, we're getting ready to close out. I don't know if you just have final words for everyone, a call to action. I was going to ask, I'm just really mindful of your time, like, do you have a current stillness practice? Like, anything you want to share um, with the community as we get ready to close out, we'd appreciate. Well, you know, I, I think you're um, part of this vast uh, network and army of women who are making a difference in how we're going to go on in the world. Because I do believe we're going to go on. I don't believe that, you know, this is the end. And I mean, I think as we aspire, so shall we become. And when I say aspire, I'm thinking of that amazing, amazing feeling that we have for the best for all of us. As we aspire, so shall we become for all of us. And and look how this has changed. Look who we are right now. Look what we've become. You know, and and as we aspire, so shall we see. And we'll see things that are new and different and we'll see what's happening. And I know life is eternal. I know our body dies, but, you know, as we aspire, so shall we rise. Mm. I can't think of better words to end on that as we aspire, so shall we rise. Dr. Francis, you're really a living legend. We are so grateful that you took this time to speak with us and to speak with our community. And we will be lifting you up as you continue your work. And we are here just walking with you. So it, just like Morgan said, anytime you need us, let us know. Y'all, let's walk in grace today and, ex and express kindness to somebody in our life just as a thank you um, of gratitude to Dr. Francis. Thank you so very, very much. We will be back here tomorrow to close out um, this week of walking. And I don't know if you know uh, James Cleveland, but I think we're we play music when we um, start and end these uh, conversations to ground it. And I did a whole playlist. It's called Be Still, Dr. John Francis. I don't know what type of music you like, but I think you're going to like the playlist. So I'm going to send it to you so you can jam <laughs> to it. Okay. <laughs> and, and the... And the next time I I will bring my banjo because that's I walk with my banjo. Oh my goodness! Yes, you are so cool. <laughs> you are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you both. Thank you both. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.